Thank you, Lord. We bless you, God. We pray, Lord, that as we look into your word this morning, that your word in turn would look into us. Father, we thank you that, Jesus, you said that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Jesus, you said of every one of us here this morning who claims your name, sanctify them, set them apart, make them like Christ by the truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and please turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 6. Today we're going to look at verses 11 to 14, and today in this sermon series, Lead Us Not Into Temptation, we are in the second week of looking at the strength of Christ for our temptation. So for three weeks of this series, we are looking in the sixth chapter of the book of Romans and sort of just unfolding truths about who we are in Christ. And this morning, I want to uh, add to last week three more powerful truths from this text. And remember, we said last week that, that we don't behave ourselves into believing something, we believe ourselves into behavior. So to live righteous, to live godly, to say no to temptation, to say no to sin is not a matter of, of knowing the right tools or having the right tools, but it's about, first of all, knowing the truth. Jesus never said, you shall know the tools and the tools shall set you free, but he said, you shall know the truth. And when you know the truth, when you know the truth of who Jesus is, when you know the truth of who you are in Jesus, that truth will set you free. But you see, the thing of it is, every one of us have, li have grown up not only being surrounded by lies, but we've also listened to some of those lies. And what Christ wants to do is renew our minds as to who he is and who we are in him. As we take a look at these powerful truths this morning, I think that, that we can take Romans chapter 6 verses 11 to 14 and make them extremely understandable if we put into our minds one picture. It's an experience that I've had in my life. In fact, if I were to ask those who are gathered here to raise your hand if you've ever had this experience, probably most hands would go up. The same true for those who are listening virtually. But I believe that if you can grasp the idea or the illustration, the metaphor, the picture of changing jobs, changing jobs, changing employment, then you will understand, I believe, uh, what Paul is presenting here in the text. So I want you to imagine changing jobs. Not just, not just a lateral move in the same company, not, not even a promotion in the same company, but imagine leaving one corporation or one job for a different career, changing employers. Uh, this happened to me way back in December of 1990, when I left a position where I was a training instructor in a large insurance corporation that had grown in the four, almost five years I was there from 800 employees to 1,600 employees. And my, my position there was I was a training instructor, um, but in December of 1990, that all came to a stop, that all came to a halt, when I entered ministry and became a youth pastor. And if you were to ask me back in December 3rd of 1990, my very first day, where I changed jobs, changed employment, changed careers, what changed about that? My response would be one word, everything. Everything changed because that's exactly what happens when you change careers or change from one corporation or one place to another place. Everything changed. And I think that what Paul would say through the text today, that when you came to know Christ 
and you became a follower of Jesus and surrendered your life to him, everything has changed. And as a result of that, you are not the same as you once were. In fact, today we're going to be taking a look at these three key words, that in Christ we have a new position, we have a new power, and we have a new purpose. That's really what is going on here in Romans chapter 6, verses 11 to 14. But I want to take you back again to my experience, and maybe you can parallel this with one of your own, where, where in December 3rd of 1990, everything changed when I changed employers, changed jobs, changed, changed careers. I remember uh, walking into the church that very first morning, and we as a church at that time were meeting in a historic building in Frederick called the Odd Fellows Home. Some of you know where the Odd Fellows Home is on North Market Street Extended. And I remember walking in my very first day of work. Remember, I had a, a, a several years of standing in front of employees and training brand new hires on the ins and outs of medical and dental health plans. And I remember walking into that church, leaving a corporation of 1,600 people to walk into a building with a smaller, much smaller, obviously, church staff. And I, I remember the first thing I did. This was before computers. I didn't even have a computer. Cell phones were like not even on the radar. It would be a few years that I would get a beeper. Anybody remember beepers? Boy, they were annoying. Because you would get a beep and you would think, okay, this is a matter of life or death. This is a 911 call. And then it was like, can you get milk on the way home or, or something like that? And I'd have to pull off at a, at a pay phone. Remember pay phones? Okay, I'm aging myself this morning. But I remember going in there and going to the secretary and getting office supplies. And I got a yellow pad, I got paper clips and a stapler and all this stuff. And I went up to my office on the third floor of this historic old building where my office was a balmy 48 degrees. First order of business, write it down, legal pad, yellow, buy, space, heater. And that, that room was so drafty that I literally had to run that space heater 24 hours a day just to keep it at room temperature. But I remember distinctly sitting at my brand new desk in my brand new office in a brand new company with brand new office supplies around me. And I literally said these words out loud, I am now a youth pastor. What does a youth pastor do? Because everything had changed. Everything had changed. My position had changed. My power had changed. In other words, I wasn't answering to the same people anymore, right? Think about that. It didn't matter what my old bosses, and I had four great women bosses in my uh, former department, and it didn't matter what they wanted me to do. That was irrelevant now, wasn't it? Because I not only had a new position, but I had a new power that I answered to, a new authority in my life, and then also, as you can imagine, a brand new purpose. That's what we're going to take a look at as we look at Romans chapter 11, uh, chapter 6, verses 11 to 14. So if you take that illustration that I just gave of employment kind of carry it over like this, because what Paul is saying is something like this, no longer are we employed by the old corporation of sin, but we are now employed into the new incorporation of being in Christ Jesus. And because of being in Christ Jesus, everything has changed. We have a new position, a new power, a new purpose. Let's look at these. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 11, he says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life 
and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. My prayer this morning is that I would be able to effectively communicate these three powerful truths that in knowing the truth, it will set us free. And the first one is this, in Christ, we have a new position. In Christ, we have a new position. I want you to look at verse 11 once again. He says these words, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Because you are in Christ, you have a brand new position. Before, in fact, every one of us who, who would say, I've surrendered my life to Jesus. Jesus is my Lord. He is the focus of my life. I may, you know, I may stumble and fall at times, but, but my life is oriented towards, towards Christ. Every one of us, our lives are, can be divided into two, two, two distinct time periods. The first one is B.C. What's B.C. stand for? Before Christ. And this is everything that we are, the position, the powers, all that before Christ. The new position is not A.D., but I.C. Before Christ, and now we are in Christ. And because we are in Christ, we have a new position. And I want you to see here, because this is incredible, how distinct this new position is. When I walked in that very first day of December 3rd, 1990, I didn't walk into that church building and say, well, this looks exactly like the insurance corporation. No, everything was different. I want you to see how different, how distinct your new position in Christ is. First, let's take a look at before Christ. Before Christ, we had an old position, and that old position could be called this, dead in sin. Dead in sin. Ephesians 2, 1 says this, and you were, notice the past tense there, because he's writing to people who are now in Christ, so he uses a past tense, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. But notice how, how radically this position has changed from being dead in sin to being dead to sin. And once again, if we were to ask the question, what has changed? The answer would be everything. In Christ, we have a new position of being dead to sin. It's, it's just like that illustration of changing jobs, changing employers. That old position is no longer there for me. I've got a brand new place. I've got a brand new position. I've got a brand new power. I've got a brand new focus. I've got a brand new purpose in Christ. And you see, isn't it true, when you, when you switch old jobs, how many of you have ever switched old jobs and then you heard about how bad things were going in that old job? And, and you entertained the thought. No, you didn't entertain it. You, you welcomed it. Thank God I'm not there anymore. Why? Because it doesn't matter what's going on over here. That's no longer you. That's not your position. And remember, and here's what we have to grab. If we don't grab this, then the truth will kind of slip through our fingers like water. This does not mean that sin's presence is dead. Just like when I switch jobs, it wasn't like when I switched jobs and now became a, 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 an employee of a church that the old insurance corporation of 1600 said, well, Tim's not here anymore. We might as well close the doors. No, that's still operating as it always has. And sin will always operate as it always has until the, until, uh, the day comes where we will be taken into glory and removed completely from sin's presence. 
So Paul is not saying that sin no longer exists, that sin is no longer present. He is saying that you have a new position of being in Christ. Now, I want you to look at this, this little tiny word. You know, some of the most important words in the Bible are tiny little words. And in verse 11, we have an example of a tiny little word that has so much importance, and it's the little word that begins verse 11. So, so, S-O, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And that little word so takes us back to everything that we looked at last week in verses 1 to 10 of Romans and is sort of like building on that with, with even more incredible truth. And we saw some truths last week from verses 1, 1 to 10. And, and, but most of all, if you missed that last week, get, watch it online or wherever we have it. Um, last week, we saw that in Romans 1 to 10, in fact, it's true here as well, the key was not that the Apostle Paul was instructing the church to do something. Remember that? The key word was no, and in fact, he uses the word no three times in that text and uses three different Greek words to describe different kinds of knowledge because he wanted them to know something, to believe something that would affect their behavior and not the other way around. We believe our way into behavior, not the opposite. And this idea is carrying into verse 11 with the key word consider. It, so... So because you know these things, so because you have these things as truth, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You must consider that you have a new position. Now, if you were to look at various versions of the Bible, that word consider is translated a number of different ways. The uh, older version of the King James Version and then the updated New King James Version, which I believe was in 1982, uses the word reckon, to reckon yourselves dead to sin. And that's a good translation. Um, the ESV along with uh, the HCSB, NRSV, and NLT use the word consider. Consider yourself dead to sin and the NIV uses yet another great translation, and it says to count yourselves dead to sin. But what is most important here, whether you, whether you prefer the word reckon, the word consider, or the word count, is that you don't think of it, and I don't think of it like this. For example, I could use the word reckon, and maybe somebody you've heard somebody say, well, I reckon it'll rain tomorrow. Now, because they reckon it will rain tomorrow, does that mean that it absolutely will rain tomorrow? No, it means what they're saying is, I think that there's a possibility that it might rain tomorrow. That is not what this word means in the original language. Or even the word consider, if I were to escape from some harrowing near-death experience, you know, someone could say this, well, consider yourself lucky. Well, the fact that I, you know, they said consider, does that mean that I was lucky? I might not feel very lucky at all, right? What we have to understand is in the original language, whether you translate it reckon, consider, or count, this is a mathematical term of precision, of exactness. It's just like, it, in, in fact, the word was used of like the reckoning of a bank statement. If your bank says that you, if my bank statement says that I have $25 in my bank and I think that I have $25,000, will it be a good idea to live as though I had $25,000? No, it would be a good idea for me to reckon or to equal what is there in precision. It's just like money in the bank. What you count, what you consider, what you reckon, what is actually there is what it is. So the Apostle Paul is not saying, reckon yourselves dead to sin, consider yourselves dead to sin, uh, count yourselves dead to sin, and just hope that it might be true. 
He is saying with this word of precision, it is absolutely the truth. You may not feel it. Remember, we talked about that. Some days I wake up, I don't feel very godly some days. I don't feel very Christian some days. Does that mean that I'm no longer in Christ? No, it means that I have feelings. The truth will set us free, never our feelings. In fact, this, this Greek word, logizomai, is where we get our English word logic from. So in Christ, you have a new position. You've, you've changed jobs. Brand new position. But just like switching jobs, when I switched jobs, it was more than just switching one location to another, right? Second truth is in Christ, we have a new power. We have a new power in our lives. In other words, to use the employee, employer situation, we report to someone new. We report to someone new. When I worked in insurance in my last position as a training instructor, I had four great women bosses. And, you know, if they told me to do something, guess what I did? I did it. I did it. But, but that all changed because of my new position. So with a new position comes a new power. Verse 12, he says, let not sin reign, therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. In fact, we could translate this uh, based uh, on uh, its construction. It's, it's referred to as a present imperative. It could be translated as, stop letting sin reign. Stop letting sin reign. In other words, sin's presence presence is always there but it doesn't have to be the ruling force in our lives and it's very possible that as Paul was writing these words that the Romans didn't know these truths they didn't know the truths of who they were in Christ they didn't know the truths of their new position and their new power but because of that notice they have a choice you have a choice I have a choice I have never sinned without choosing to sin. And he says to these believers, you've got choice A or B to continue to let sin reign, which we know that leads to death. That's like listening to the old boss. Or choice B, to consider themselves dead to sin, leading to life. In other words, you've got a new boss. Now imagine that I had an old employer, an old boss, and that old boss required me and told me, you know, to do something that is, that could be reckless or even dangerous or hazardous to my life. Did I have a choice in that? Like, like what if I got a job? I saw this on YouTube. It made my hands sweat just looking at it, but it showed these guys that, that go up on these cell phone towers and looking down and they take video of themselves. And, and uh, you know, if, if I had that as work, my, my power could tell me to get up there and do it, right? But I have a new power. You have a new power in your life. You're not taking orders anymore from that before Christ boss of sin but you have a new power you have a new employer christ whose orders who whose commands because guess what jesus jesus has commands he wants us to follow right in other words coming to christ isn't a free-for-all i do whatever i feel like doing it's being in obedience to a different boss and the bible says that his commands are not burdensome their life giving. Now, what if, what if my old boss, once I had started that new job, called me up on the cell phone and began barking out orders to me? W would I stop the, the sermon that I was working on that I was going to present to the youth, uh, youth group on Wednesday night? W would I have to listen to that? And you don't either. 
new position, new power. Thirdly, in Christ, we have a new purpose. Go ahead and raise your hand to this one if you've ever received what is called a job description. A job description. When you change employers, when you change positions, when you have a new person to report to that is power in your life, in that employee-employer relationship, you also have a new job description, don't you? That means that you have a new purpose. And verse 13 is, in Christ, this is our new purpose, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Do you realize it's almost like, it's almost like this is our daily job description? This is our daily job description as a follower of Jesus, you know, everything Jesus says, you know, love, you know, love one another or love that, that person that's unloving or love your enemies, it can fit right in here, right? Present yourselves to God. Where Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. We can fit it right in here in the job description. Present yourselves to God. And again, let me, let me read this. This is kind of my translation um, because one of the things with the Greek language is unlike English where we have a past tense, a present tense, and a future tense, there are at least five tenses in Greek, and even with those, there are like different idiosyncrasies of, of the different ones or whatever. A good translation would be something like this. Stop presenting your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. In other words, just you can see it on the outline sheet if you have that it's in the bulletin you can download it i wrote in brackets present imperative that means stop doing something you're you're doing now and don't pick it back up stop presenting yourselves to uh to sin stop presenting your members to sin as instruments for righteousness now what happens here is the verb tense changes which is equally important he says Stop presenting your members to sin as instruments for unrighteous, but decisively present right now. That's the idea behind what is called an aorist imperative. It refers to a command that is to obey, be obeyed at once. Don't put it off. Don't make excuses for it. Do it and do it right now. Present yourselves to God. And again, going back to that employer employment we have a new employer christ and a new place of employment god's kingdom and what paul's words here are are like saying to someone who has changed jobs stop showing up at your old place of employment now imagine wouldn't that be kind of ridiculous you change jobs and let's say let's say like like with my job i changed a one hour commute on a very good day to about a 20-minute commute from Walkersville, or from Walkersville to Frederick. Would it just be kind of like, what are you, would you say to me, what are you doing if I kept showing up at the old address? You've got a new address. You've got a new place of employment. His words are like saying, stop showing up at the old place of employment. Now, I want to leave you with two critical thoughts that really kind of put put this all together because what I have said so far this morning could be misunderstood. We could say, we could say this, based on everything that you have just said, Pastor Tim, you make it sound is though because we have a new position, a new power, and a new purpose, that now, we, that, that now we never sin. Is that what you are saying? And my answer to that is no, that is not what I'm saying. What I would say is this, that based on the authority of the New Testament and the words of Jesus, your primary identity is not just a sinner who sins, You are a saint who sometimes sins. 
And there's a big difference between the two. And, and really, I think the question here is not a question of perfection. If I stand up here and give you these three truths, that you've got a new position, a new power, a new purpose, as though I have not sinned this week, this month, this year, then I am the worst of hypocrites. But you see, there is a difference. And to use the illustration, you know what? Let's face it. Sometimes in the weakness of our flesh, we end up showing up at the old employer, don't we? Sometimes due to the weakness of our flesh, even though we have a new power, a new boss, we sometimes listen to that old boss because they can, they, they can call us up pretty loud in our mind and scream at us, right, to do something. And you see, we're so used to just jumping at what they said to do that sometimes when that old boss of sin, sin calls, we, we give in to it. So this isn't a question of perfection. This isn't a question of any one of us standing up and saying, you know, I've had a sinless week. The question is not one of perfection, but direction. Direction. Are we moving in this direction that is here in Romans 6 and what has been present in this series all along? Are we moving in that direction of growing in these truths? that we are dead to sin and alive to God, growing in the, the experience of presenting ourselves to God rather than sin. I want to leave you with a final picture that, that to me, this is so helpful in my life, and I believe it will be in yours. There is a difference, isn't it, between falling down on the mountain and falling from the mountain. Have you ever seen, maybe on television or a show or whatever, and I remember last year we watched this show where this guy was going to climb up like a, over 10,000, just basically a, a wall of rock with no, with no safety gear. Um, or or you, have you ever seen climbers, or it's always in the movies like where they're climbing and then all of a sudden they slip and you see the like rocks and the pebbles go down. That's, there's a big difference between that, right? and falling completely off the mountain. We are not people that fall completely off the mountain. We may fall down on the mountain. We may, we may skin ourselves, and that's where 1 John 1, 9, that if, you, that if anyone sins, confess your sins, um, and, and he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteous. We may fall down on the mountain, And that's where Proverbs says a righteous person gets up seven times. Though they fall seven times, they get up again. But we're not falling off the mountain. Why? Because we have a new position, a new power, a new purpose in Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you said that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Lord, I pray that, I I realize that in just a a a once-a-week message on this, to renew our minds is something we need to dwell on and think about constantly. And Lord, whether we do that through reading other books, like the two supplemental books that I've I've recommended, um, or listen to messages related to this, God, renew our minds with the truth that will set us free, that we are in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for that new position of being in Christ. That, Lord, even though that old position, you know, may still call us up every once in a while, even though that old position and sin's presence is still there, that that, Lord, we have a new position and a new power. Lord, let us be people that, Lord, you said to walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. That's what I desire to see in my life, God. Would you just take a moment to be with Jesus and and just ask Jesus, Jesus, what are you saying to me through this? Because Jesus has truth for us that is life-giving, 
and sets us free. Let's just take that moment of silence. Lord Jesus, we thank you that our life is not about having laws around us, but it is about having Christ within us. Lord, may we be people that hear what the Spirit is saying to us, the church. May we be people, Lord, that even though we will lack perfection, until that day when the presence of all sin is removed, Lord, that we would be moving in the direction of living and walking in truth that sets us free. Lord, thank you for your love and acceptance and forgiveness that as believers and as followers we may fall down on the mountain, but that you are faithful and just, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, I pray today might be a day that for any who have have felt like, wow, I've really fallen here or fallen over in this area, that this would be a new day of getting up in the strength of our loving God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to do one more thing before we say the Lord's Prayer. John, will you look on that, that back, uh, no, the table in front of you. There is, a, there is a set of bookmarks that are like light blue in color. Can you bring me one of those, please? Before you leave church, I want you to grab one of these. And for those of you that are listening in virtually but would like one of these, please, thank you, write an email to Walkersville Community Church, all one word, Walkersville Community Church at gmail.com. We want you to have one of these. This is a bookmark that says, Who am I or, or who I am in Christ? And here's the truth of who you are in Christ. This is the truth of who I am in Christ. I'm accepted, I am secure, and I am significant. And and under each one of those headings, there's different truths, like I am accepted, I am God's child, I am Christ's friend, I have been justified. Why is this so important? Because this is the truth that will set us free. And all of us have grown up, and we've listened to voices that have been in our lives that have not told the truth about who we are in Jesus So I want to make sure you get this. But see, here's the thing. Just kind of reading this, okay, I'm like this. That's not going to change it. We need to let this truth get into our heart. We need to let this truth change our minds so that we believe what God says about us because what God says about us is the truest thing about us. Why would I want to live in what others have said about me growing up, especially things that have wounded me or, or things that said from childhood or whatever the case may be or uh, kids in school, whatever, it doesn't matter. We've all had lying voices in our lives. Let's, let's renew our minds through the truth of God's word. I'd like to invite you to stand, please. As we pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you so much for being here and being part of our virtual community. I love you. I pray you have a great week in Christ.